uh, I'm excited to get into this. Uh, you know, when the pandemic hit, we all heard the phrase, this is unprecedented times. This is an unprecedented event. Well, as the title of our event suggests, clearly there is a precedent and one that hopefully we can learn a lot from tonight. So here's the big question for the evening. How can lessons learned during and after the 1918 influenza pandemic inform our current city planning responses to COVID-19? Uh, and under that big question, there are a couple important goals. Uh, first, to support and create an online space for thoughtful, reflective conversation on how our city has evolved and for bringing out ideas for what we need to be paying attention to as we look to the future. And second, ground the post-pandemic work of the Vancouver City Planning Commission in an understanding of the legacy of our past. No pressure. So here's a little you know, timeline of how this evening will go. In a minute, I'll introduce you to our panelists. Each panelist will have four minutes of opening remarks uh, discussing you know, how the 1918 influenza pandemic changed Vancouver and whether we should anticipate similar changes in the months and years ahead. Uh, that will be followed by a discussion among the pan panelists moderated by myself. And following that, we will open up the discussion and invite your questions and comments uh, in the Q&A function that I mentioned earlier. So without further ado, here are your panelists for the evening. First up, we have Mary Rowe, the president and CEO of the Canadian Urban Institute. In her role at the CUI, Mary has spearheaded a number of COVID-19 initiatives that offer important conversations, analysis, commentary, and guidance on the new urban reality under COVID-19. Then we have Wade Grant. Wade is an intergovernmental officer with the Musqueam Indian Band. He has served as a Musqueam counselor, a Vancouver police board member, and a special advisor to former Premier Christy Clark. Throughout his career, Grant has shown his dedication to intercultural dialogue and community engagement. Then we have Dr. Kelly Lee, uh, who is a tier one Canada research chair in global health governance and professor in the faculty of health sciences. Wow, that's a mouthful. Oh, at Simon Fraser University. She is currently leading an international team analyzing the role of travel restrictions and other border measures during COVID-19. Finally, we have John Atkin, who is a civic historian, author, and heritage consultant who has explored Vancouver like few others, offering prescient insights on urban planning and development. So now I will turn over the mic or, or the screen to our first panelist, uh, Mary. What do you have to say about this topic? Well, first of all, I just wanna say hi, thanks for inviting me. And uh, it's uh, a little later here in Ontario, just saying, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit the Chippewa, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, home to many, many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples now across Turtle Island. Um, we're covered under the Mississaugas of the Credit signed Treaty 13, and the Williams Treaty was signed with uh, several Anishinaabek nations. And uh, um, the Canadian Urban Institute is a national institute, but I happen to be in Toronto tonight. And uh, we have been struggling, I would say, during COVID to come to terms with the legacies of exclusion and the ways in which urbanism, urbanism practice has uh, sustained those. Uh, I mean, we've been doing it for years and years and years and decades. And now um, I've been suggesting that COVID was like a particle accelerator. Every pre-existing condition that wasn't working in a city or that was dysfunctional in a city just has been made much worse, exacerbated like crazy, uh, and uh, and happening more quickly. Everything is just uh, on a, 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 a tighter time scale, and that is for better and for worse. Uh, so good things that we may have been advocating for for a long time that people kept saying would take years to happen have happened and all sorts of crummy things that have been festering and not resolved, uh, overcrowding, poorly designed neighborhoods, um, lots and lots of uh, uh, inequality in terms of amenities, uh, some neighborhoods well served by public space, some not, some with really walkable neighborhoods, some with absolutely the opposite, uh, concentrations of people. Uh, lower income in neighborhoods that aren't well serviced and where their risks are greater. You look at those heat maps of COVID and across the country and it's staggering how it lines up with lower income and often people, communities of color. So mm. honestly, folks, like if this isn't our reckoning, if we, I, I've been trying to advance this cheery little hashtag, hashtag no more excuses. Like we've got to find a way to come out of this in a much, in a much different form. And I think that I, I, I will leave it to my colleagues to comment specifically about Vancouver and particularly about the pandemic and the effect of the, 19, of the Spanish flu um, and what happened. I'll, I'll offer some cautionary things. You know, there's a great, great adage 
a great smart tendency that we all have to be careful of, which is that there's a tendency to overlearn from history. When they were heading into World War II, they thought everything would be like World War One. You know, it's we. This is not actually. We have not actually had anything like this before. Um, the Spanish flu was an extraordinary event. My colleagues will speak about that. Um, there are lots of similarities, but this is a very different time, a very different economy, a very different cultural makeup, a very different um, context of interconnection that we have globally and that we have locally. So I, I want us to be very careful, and, I, and I've been very cautious on the programs that you referenced um, that we've been running. At, uh, we run something called City Talk, citytalkcanada.ca, and we've been doing it since early into the pandemic. And we have been asking all our participants to not prognosticate. It's just way too easy to do this. Oh, this is what it's going to be like. Oh, mm -hmm. you know what? We really haven't a fucking clue what it's going to be like. And uh, to use the common vernacular spoken after 10 o'clock here in Toronto. And um, I, I just want us to be careful about this because everything is changing. It's all changing. And when you get all the combination of factors that are at, at work here, I don't think we can pr be predictive. Um, you know, do, did we know that after cholera uh, was finally, when they finally figured out what the source of cholera was in London in the 19th century, did that? Did they really know that that would lead to a complete um, uh, a takeover of municipal water systems? I doubt it. Like, I, I don't think that we actually will know. I think part of what my encouragement is to my colleagues uh, always is that we just pay a lot of attention to what we're seeing. So part of what we did at, at CUI is we created some platforms so people could visually see. We started City Watch Canada, which is all the municipal governments, 62 municipal governments across the country, not all of them, but the 62 biggest across the, 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 all the provinces and territories, uh, to say, see what were municipal governments doing and when did they do it? When did they declare emergencies? When did they, what, what particular actions have they had to take? And we continue to monitor that. And then we started in parallel something called City Share Canada, which is examples of community-based resilience. From my own experience, because I'm old, and I had been in New Orleans after Katrina for five years, and I was in New York during Sandy, and I learned hard, the hard way, that governments get overwhelmed very quickly in dealing with these, uh, these extraordinary events. And the pressure starts to mount that you need uh, solutions and you need responses on the ground. And if you wait for government, uh, you're going to wait a long time. So uh, in fact, what happens is people stop waiting. They realize that they're the ones they've been waiting for and they start to improvise and come up with solutions. And if you go to City Share Canada, whenever you're feeling depressed about all this, as I often am in the middle of the night, scroll through City Share Canada, you'll see hundreds of examples of where there's been remarkable innovation and remarkable solution finding that local communities have been going through, not just governments, but uh, not-for-profits and community groups and neighbors and church groups and service clubs and every kind of configuration you can imagine people are out there trying to figure this out. And I would say that, that that's to me, the more instructive thing to do rather than spending 10 seconds predicting, Oh, uh, we're going to have bike lanes forever or, Oh, you know, I, I would be very cautious about that. I think we don't actually know. One thing that we have to be, wary of is that after these kinds of shocks happen there'll be all sorts of calls you can already hear it now about how we want to build back better and what we do know is that there is a tendency to regress to the mean that there will be a tendency to just bring back to, people will have a nostalgic feeling that they want to go back to the way things were and what i would caution about that is that there were a lot of things that were that were crummy and if we return to those crummy things then it will just take another disaster uh, of some sort and those same challenges will manifest in a different kind of way. Recognizing that COVID is only one of the emergencies we're dealing with. You know, in the middle of COVID, then we find we suddenly, not suddenly, but we get to a breaking point in terms of people feeling disadvantaged and lack of equity and opportunity. And so Black Lives Matter and all the anti-Black racism and all the issues around exclusion have surfaced and they're not going to go away. So we've got that. We've got the climate challenge. We've got all sorts of um, new, new, new intensity of negotiations around indigenous rights, um, around the right to housing. Uh, so all of this kind of foment is not going to be contained. You know, that, and that adage I'll accept, that Pandora's box, the lid's open, and there's no way you can put the genie back in the bottle. There, I think I've put five metaphors into one sentence. So I think we have to be mindful 
We have to be uh, really uh, uh, pay attention to what we actually are seeing happen. I'm a little uh, losing my patience with people that want to just prevaricate about, or not prevaricate, but they just want to uh, orate about it's got to be this, it's got to be that. I think we have to start looking really practically about what needs to change and what can each of us do to do that. Um, I think just in closing, uh, I think it, I'm 61 years old and I am completely confident in this one thing, that this event will completely dominate the balance of my work life. And it will have an extraordinary impact on your career, Ute, and anyone in your generation. This will shape the balance of your work life, even though you're early into your work life. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a moment of inflection. Societies are changing. Uh, economies are changing. The ways, we pro the ways we're going to solve problems are changing. And, and so I think it's an opportunity that I don't think we should want to squander. I think we should take advantage of the fact that we have a bit of a pause. I think we, we're being given an extraordinary gift of a redo. You hardly ever get that. I'm trying to think in my career if I've ever seen it like this. Don't think I have. This is our moment. It's kind of an all hands on deck redo. And what I hope for, so I'll give you my hope. I hope that what we will do is focus in on the, the things that around us in our spatial environment that really matter and how we as individuals, as, as people that live in communities and cities can actually have a, an impact on how those, are, how those um, resurface. So that's the, your main street, that's the public parks, that's all the amenities that are around you, which is why we're focusing at uh, CUI on Bring Back Main Street and restoring the core, the two components um, that we think are the ingredients of what really makes cities, city life and city economies thrive and our life together thrive. So I think it's a, I think it's a pregnant moment that we should be seizing if we can get, if we can just get through. And I hope we get through with empathy and imagination. Thanks for asking me. Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, you had some really, really great insights. And I think some really sobering ones, if I'm honest with you. Uh, Really appreciate you joining so late uh, in your time zone as well. Uh, uh, I, you know, I will say I really share a lot of your concerns, and so I hope you don't have too much trouble sleeping tonight. Uh, <laughs> but on that note, I, I'm going to pass it off to our next uh, guest and panelist, Wade Grant. Uh, what are your sort of thoughts on this uh, issue? Well, well, thank you for having me. And as I, I said earlier today, I am sitting in my bed. Uh, right now because I have my two kids doing their homework in the other room so that's why you see me sitting here uh, in this in this uh, area of my house and uh, you know it, for me you know I look back at the stories and the history that my my ancestors and my elders had, had had spoken to me there's not much that I I know about the the Spanish influenza that, that came through 1918 and probably not um, you know something that they, they'd even heard of because back then, uh, indigenous people, and especially those that are on the Muscombe Indian Reserve, which is located in uh, the city of Vancouver, were not even considered people. Uh, so we were uh, out of sight, out of mind, uh, but we did have um, a very uh, awful uh, connection to viruses uh, in and around our, um, our, our communities, uh, right across uh, British Columbia and, and Canada, as we all know, that there were uh, smallpox epi epidemics and, and other epidemics that decimated our, our populations. Uh, so we have um, been very diligent in trying to, uh, to um, protect our community. We're a very small community. We have a, uh, a population of about 1,400 people, but we only live on about 150 acres of, uh, of our traditional territory, uh, which, is, uh, our traditional, which is about 0.02% of what we lived on uh, since time immemorial. So what we've been trying to do is, uh, is limit the, the access to our, our community uh, in the last uh, six months. We have, uh, we have blockade, not blockades, but we have checkpoints in uh, every entrance to our community uh, because we still, even though it's, it's many, many generations ago, we still have a very um, um, long memory when it comes to how our uh, elders and our ancestors were affected by different, uh, different um, uh, diseases and influenzas that came through our community. So we are trying to ensure that our community is, is safe. So what we 
have been doing is uh, is putting up roadblocks and, and ensuring that nobody comes in unless they have uh, official business. The uh, which has has helped us uh, ensure that there's been no uh, COVID nineteen uh, cases in 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 Musqueam. Uh, we are one of the very few uh, in the last. Uh, month or or so of indigenous communities that don't have any in our in our communities we're, we're hoping that that will continue and we want to ensure that that continues but looking back at the history of our, our communities we we see that that uh this can uh this can spread out very rapidly and we're trying to hope that we're trying to make sure that, the, that those sorts of things are are not uh repeated Well, thank you so much, Wade. And I'm really glad you brought up the uh, the example of smallpox and the impact it had uh, historically on Indigenous communities. I was, funny enough, like just reading up on it a bit before this uh, webinar, uh, and I read a McLean's article that kind of looked at, you know, at least the outbreak in British Columbia, it was started off as a really terrible, like failed epidemic response. Like the smallpox had first sort of made its way in Victoria. And then the city of Victoria at the time thought, hey, here's a great idea. We're going to expel all the indigenous people living in the city uh, back to their uh, you know, traditional territories uh, because we, we are suspecting that that's where the, the disease is spreading. And so I, I, I think uh, there's, I'm sure there's a lot to, to, to reflect on there. Uh, now I, I'm going to, to pass off, you know, without wasting too much time here, uh, the, the, to our next uh, speaker, Kelly, uh, who has a bit more of a global perspective on this matter. Uh, I'm really curious to hear your thoughts. Uh, what what is the sort of the lessons? I mean, I don't know if you're going to take it from the historical angle, but yeah, just just curious for what you have to say. Sure. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's it's a privilege to to be speaking to everyone. I think Yuri's going to just throw up. I have four slides that I'm going to just show. Um, people just to illustrate, here we go, very efficiently, thank you. So um, good evening everyone, so I'm Kelly. I uh, I, I bring, I guess, an, a, a global perspective to this subject. So I spent my career studying health for, on a global scale um, and particularly how health is being impacted by an increasingly interconnected world. So I've spent about 25 years or so studying the, ro the role of the World Health Organization, other organizations that operate at that level, including, you know, pandemic response. So studied previous pandemics, um, pandemic influenza, the Ebola virus, and so on. And I've really focused on international cooperation. So one of the lessons, I guess, is that this is not a time for individualism. This is really a time for government, for societies, for collective action uh, on all our parts. Uh, but my gaze is really at the global level um, rather than the municipal level. Um, could, could you go to the next slide? But there are, I think, um, some important things that you that I can draw from my work that's relevant to a city like Vancouver. So, so first of all, these issues um, demonstrate really that the local and the global are interconnected. And I don't think I need to explain that to anyone, um, that we're living in a global era uh, in the 21st century and there's unprecedented travel and trade and communication and this is how this pandemic has reached our shores you know we, we can't cut ourselves off um, I don't think we could have ever cut ourselves off a hundred years ago but today is very different so things come to our shores much quicker than than they have in the past um, so my work at the moment is looking at border controls tra travel restrictions and whether that's even possible in an era where people are very dependent on travel and trade and a city like Vancouver, which is incredibly um, interconnected with the rest of the world. Um, next slide, please. So what I wanted to show you though, is, is to try and draw lessons from my work in that I want to try and locate this pandemic within a historical context, um, not just the one that was a hundred years ago, but in human history. So what I, I really like this graphic because it, it shows that, you know, there's been a lot of pandemics, first of all, and um, somebody made this graphic. This is not my graphic. But what I think is really interesting is that it kind of gives you the relative size of past pandemics in terms of number of deaths that have been caused. And what you will note here is that as bad as COVID has been so far, and of course, we're just partway through that, it's by far not the deadliest pandemic that humanity has seen. 
So we have to recognize that, that we've had many in the past. Uh, smallpox was mentioned, but we've had, you know, obviously the, the um, pandemic influenza in 1918, but we've had several other influenza pandemics. We've had the Black Death, which is um, the biggest puffball there, and then all the way to the previous SARS outbreak in 2002, 2003. So that's really important to recognize. And it's also important to recognize that hundreds of disease events are reported to WHO every year. So some of all of those don't become pandemics, of course. Many of them are very localized and become local outbreaks or epidemics. Pandemics are thankfully rare in terms of um, number of disease events that happen every year, but we do need to pay attention to them. And we need to pay attention to them more than ever because of what I just described, this really global world that we live in. And then finally, my last slide, if, if, if you could go to that one. So I just wanted to um, contribute a little personal note. So I was born and raised in downtown east side of Vancouver. Uh, I actually grew up on opposite Oppenheimer Park. And then our family moved to East Vancouver near the P&E. And so both my parents were born in Vancouver. And I grew up in this. So they grew up in the Strathcona area. I spent a bit of time there. It was actually my grandfather who is shown here, Sam Lee. He was known as Sam. It was Kum Shane Lee. He settled in BC in 1911. So he would have lived through that pandemic. He settled in um, first going working in my um, mining camps, but then eventually came to Vancouver and became one of those vegetable vendors, those kind of uh, people that went around and sold vegetables to people. And he was taxed at a higher rate than other uh, non-Chinese um, vendors. So he worked really hard and he managed to pay that $500 head tax to get into bank into Canada. And he paid another $500 to get his wife in. Um, so my grandfather, as I say, lived through this pandemic. Um, he lived in the Chinatown area. Chinese weren't allowed outside really to live, say, in, you know, the, like today in all parts of Vancouver. Um, many people, um, you know, were, were sort of concentrated in that area in downtown Vancouver. Uh, but he managed to survive and he had seven children, including my father, who is in this photo. He's the tallest, oldest son there. And so happily, that's why I'm sitting here. Um, and I'm happy to share some of his uh, the stories that I heard about his life at the time, but it was pretty tough because he, I think, like like Wade said, wasn't considered a person. Um, you know, I think the Chinese and the indigenous communities were close because they were the marginalized communities in Vancouver. So, um, so it was pretty tough uh, at the time, and there wasn't a lot of access to health care and things that we have today. Um, you know, clean housing, water, sanitation. It was pretty pretty basic, but. Um, you know, that's one of the lessons I think we learn is that we have to make sure that we don't have communities like that going forward. And we still do. And that is probably the Achilles heel of any city is that when you have a, a population that's marginalized, um, you then everybody else is also vulnerable. So we have to take um, Bonnie Henry's advice and be kind to everyone. And we mean everyone uh, and, and to take care of each other. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kelly, for your thoughts. Uh, I am definitely noticing a pretty common thread here tonight around marginalized communities and how uh, pandemics and other sort of really uh, traumatic events such as the one we are in right now have a tendency of disproportionately affecting those that are, are more vulnerable and, and perhaps uh, in some cases systematically or intentionally made so uh, by you know, our, you know, uh, the powers that be. Uh, but with that, uh, last but not least, I'd like to pass it off to you, John, uh, for the final comments of the night uh, before we go into our discussion. Well, I come from it from looking at sort of the history of the city um, and also the connections, because I'm always intrigued. You know, there is an event that happens, but it's what was there before and what came afterwards. Um, it's always intriguing for me and similar to you know, figuring out the cholera and then the takeover of the water companies and, the, and removing the private companies from that uh, sort of distribution of water and very poor quality water, usually, certainly in London. Um, and in Vancouver, what intrigued me about this was that when you start reading the newspapers and, and just you put in Spanish flu or influenza and, and things and localize it to, to the Vancouver paper, it, you know, the parallels are surprising to what we have today just in terms of just the crowds and you know the theater performances that are canceled and then 
uh, you're not doing this celebration, the fair gets cancelled, etc. So there's all of that. There is also a stream in there of groups, a variety of dis- different groups from uh, industry uh, folks to surprisingly a group of bootleggers in Ontario that want regulations lifted because of the influenza. And it's partly business needs to survive, so we need to relax the regulations. And in Ontario, the bootleggers actually asked if the Ontario Temperance Act could be temporarily lifted because they were promoting whiskey as a way of preventing influenza. Now, that didn't fly, but they tried it on for size. Um, But I think one of the interesting things for Vancouver is we were three separate municipalities. And and if we think of Vancouver, you know, Vancouver to 16th Avenue, roughly, um, you know, Boundary Road out to Alma, and then Point Grey, you know, Canby Street out to the University of British Columbia, and then South Vancouver, Canby Street out to Boundary Road in the city of Burnaby. You had three different responses to the um, pandemic. Uh, you, and you had not a provincial health officer, but you had city of Vancouver, South Vancouver, and Point Grey medical health officers. And if you take that out to the lower mainland, each of the communities was making decisions based on their medical health officer. And so in Langley, for instance, they let a large event go ahead because the medical health officer said, there isn't the flu here yet. And it was the yet bit that got me because three days later in the newspaper, they're canceling something big because the flu is in Langley. And so the responses were different based on the community. And then I had some little bit to do, I think, with socioeconomic conditions and things like that. But moving forward, what I find interesting, and I think, you know, it's not a complete thesis, and I'm sure there's massive holes you could drive trucks through it. But when you look at the pandemic and the concerns around health, crowds, the idea of fresh air, all of those sorts of things, and then you you take it into the 1920s and you start to see discussion in sort of planning regulations around crowding and housing conditions and the focus starts to turn and the language starts to turn to sort of disease related talking about communities and so um, I live in Strathcona the old east end and uh, that neighborhood along with the neighborhoods that ringed False Creek and the downtown core were often targeted by uh, health officials initially and then later uh, some planning officials because of they felt that the areas were, um, well, as they put it, they were almost ready to breed blight. And, and the, the discussion they had was sort of that a neighborhood like mine of little Victorian houses, you know, a population, it was a mixed immigrant population, um, you know, and by the 50s, early 60s, it was, you know, 60% Chinese here, it used to be a large Japanese neighborhood. But in the 1920s, the city building a chief architect, A.G. Bird, started talking about blight and nipping blight in the bud to stop the spread of the disease. And that leads to formulating the urban renewal programs that targeted cities across Canada in the post-Second World War period, where it was wholesale clearance. And it wasn't about community. It was just getting rid of the blighted area. But the blight was on visual. The blight wasn't on, was this a healthy community? And I think you can take that back to a lot of the discussion that was happening in the pandemic and some of the discussions around the need for fresh air, the need for, you know, no crowds. And it also gets into, unfortunately, a nasty piece, certainly in Vancouver, um, in that not... Well, one of the uh, health officers, uh, Dr. Underhill, in one speech to a group talked about how the flu was because of all the foreigners that lived in Vancouver. And, and then he just left it as that, as a blanket statement, that it's, it's all those other folks that have caused this. But then a year later, he's at another planning uh, citizens group, and someone asked a very pointed question about Chinatown and about how Chinatown should be swept off the earth because, of course, it's disease ridden. And his response was, well, actually, Chinatown's doing pretty good, but it's the other neighborhoods of Vancouver that are unhealthy. And his 
thing there was that they'd inspected the hell out of Chinatown over the years just because it was a targeted area. Um, and Chinatown's an area of interest for me. So, um, but, it, but they targeted Chinatown all the time and there were demolition orders and clearance orders and things like that. But by the you know, 1920, Mr. Underhill was actually saying, no, Chinatown's pretty good, but you gotta look at the West End, gotta look at Kitsilano, gotta look at the East End. And he was talking again about crowded housing conditions. So I think for me, the takeaway of the pandemic is then the knock-on impact of the regulatory structure that builds up to correct, quote unquote, aspects of older parts of the city that they felt maybe there was a cause and effect during the pandemic. And so a lot of planning language takes on sort of a disease or health, you know, eradication kind of language through that. And then that leads to, as I said before, leads to that urban renewal program, which I think is partly around that erasure of the ugliness and the unhealthy. And unfortunately in Vancouver, it's also targeted at ethnic populations. But I, do, I think there's a linkage through that um, from the pandemic. Um, and then I'll just, one totally trivial thing. In the newspaper in 1919 in July, uh, they were talking about how if you couldn't go to the office, and there wasn't a wholesale ban on the office, but theaters were closed and various things. But they said, if you can't get to the office, the columnist wrote, do remember the telephone is still working and it can be used for business if you have the patience for a connection. And that's that. So I'll leave you with that trivial note. I love that, John. I feel like there is definitely uh, some uh, connective tissue on that to uh, my experience with Zoom and Skype and all of the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, online video apps. Uh, certainly some patience required, but also we'll say like, I'm fascinated by what you just said there uh, on how there was almost like an overcorrection uh, in response to uh, this sort of fear of disease and outbreaks of disease, especially in sort of these uh, historic, older, maybe a bit more denser parts of the city. So, you know, uh, I'm going to move it on to some questions that I have. And on that note, I'd like to maybe pose a question to everyone here on the panel, just of, you know, how, you know, can we avoid maybe that sort of a mistake? How do we avoid sort of overcorrecting uh, in our sort of fear of the uh, of COVID right now? I mean, we know that Maybe from now on, we'll, everyone will be washing hands a lot more and maybe a bit more germophobic, but how do we keep our urban policies our, or, or even just general attitudes uh, uh, from becoming a bit, maybe a bit classist, a little bit more exclusive or, uh, you know, uh, or more, uh, perhaps more evil than that? <laughs> I open up to you guys. No, I think it's really complicated because I was, I'm, I'm really struck by Kelly's slide. I asked her to send it to me and then I just went onto the website, the Visual Capitalist website to look at it. Sure. Um, because the dilemma that we've got is if that slide were actually publicly um, in the discourse, there, it would just strengthen the anti-maskers and the people that feel that um, this pandemic kind of pales in comparison to others. Um, and why are we making such a big fuss over it? Uh, look at how much, you know, look at how much more dramatic the other impacts were. So um, I'm not, I am not actually that concerned about overcorrection. I don't know, I don't actually know quite where you're going on that, Ute, because, um, you know, do I think that, um, do I think that it's a bad thing that, I mean, I'm one of those people that's kind of delighted that the compulsory hugging is gone. Uh, you know, I'm a warm person, but I used to oh, find that, no. oh my God, I used to find that greeting thing, that greeting ritual, you know. <laughs> Do you hug them? Do you kiss them once? Do you kiss them twice? Do you, I used to, I found that negotiation kind of a pain in the ass. So I'm just delighted now that we just sort of bow or have some kind of acknowledgement. I hope that'll stick. I mean, these are trivial things, but I, I'm actually not worried about overcorrection in that way. Um, I'm old enough to remember resenting um, having to wear a seatbelt when I went uh, to drive. Mm -hmm. When I first learned to drive, you didn't have to wear a seatbelt and I resented it. Um, mm -hmm. I resented when you had to practice safe sex all of a sudden condoms were the thing. I resented it. I remember thinking, I didn't, why do, why do I have to do that? Why is my generation having to do that? Um, but you know, you just acclimate to these kinds of things and then it just sort of makes sense. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not too worried about that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would be more concerned 
about um, certain kinds of equity practices that we're being forced to do now. Hmm. And that somehow it's going to be too easy to, uh, to lose the urgency of that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, so that's what I, you know, you know, that, uh, you know, that old phrase, it's so overused, never waste a crisis. I, I'll be concerned. So, so here's a very big one. Um, cities aren't, aren't cities in Canada are not, uh, are not, uh, uh, appropriately resourced financially. We have an mm -hmm. old archaic system of governance that it's vertically oriented with all the power sitting in the federal government, all the money being collected, the federal government, the provincial governments. And then, you know, cities are kind of an afterthought that are the creatures of the province. And you can see during COVID that municipalities have been caught holding the bag on every, on every file. They don't have the resources. They've had to go into debt or they've had to ex go, ex they have no user fees. They have all their revenue sources are not there. These are, this is a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. And we have to find a way to alter the way in which we've configured municipal government and the way we fund it. We just have to do that. And, and it's ridiculous that we haven't. And I'm hoping that this crisis will compel us to do so. So I'm not so worried about overcorrecting in, in that way, in the way that I think you were getting at. Right, you sort of, I like the phrase, don't waste a crisis. There's a real opportunity maybe to do some big things. So maybe we shouldn't be quite as concerned about, you know, uh, yeah, making our own sort of. You know, there were, you know, we there have been conversations for for decades, for the last thirty years about about whether we need to alter our constitution to deal with cities, and everyone says, oh no 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 oh, no 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 you can't do it. Well, we were able to mobilize millions billions of dollars into Canadians' hands in the space of a couple of weeks. We've been able to mm -hmm. approve all sorts of built form things that people talk, said would take seven, eight, nine years that we've been able to do in three weeks. Mm -hmm. So. We can't ever, I don't think, accept some suggestion that it's too complicated or it will take too long. I just think that that's not acceptable anymore. For sure. Well, really appreciate your comments, Mary. Would anyone else on the panel like to maybe respond to that or have some thoughts on there? I, I'd love to jump in. Um, sure. And I, I agree, it's not about overcorrection, it's about misguided, <laughs> yes. and, um, ill, ill and advised action. And there's a lot of that going on. So. Um, that that slide was not to support anti-maskers by any means, and I think that's the. You know what I mean, Kelly? Like I think it would. Exactly be, what you mean? I, if it, people look at it, they'd say, "Well, look, the bubonic plague is this big monster thing, and the coronavirus <laughs> is tiny." And that's right. And and the real message there is that we need to pay more attention and you know uh, strengthen our public health systems and um, be be more resilient, more more prepared and so on. That was, that was the point, but I know that, you know, people can interpret things different ways. And, you know, the reason, the reason I think it's important not to be um, going down that route is because we see time and again, um, people, um, wh when there's a vacuum of, of real um, evidence, in comes fear, in comes prejudice, and then all these kind of, you know, conspiracy theories come out. So blaming foreigners is a real classic and um, mm -hmm. it conflates all sorts of things. And that's really, really dangerous. So this is what happened, you know, when, when um, communities get labeled as dirty or unsanitary, whatever, um, fear and prejudice comes in. Even labeling the Spanish influenza as Spanish. It's not Spanish. Mm -hmm. You know, it was never from Spain. You know, but the fact that it gets labeled that and goes down in history. Now, we're you know, we've heard Wuhan virus. We don't want to... Put geog, you know, blame by attaching the name to a, a geographical area. These viruses emerge around the world. They can come from anywhere, um, and so labeling them as such is really kind of just playing into that game of of saying, you know, dirty foreigners coming here. We're 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 innocent. You know, we're all complicit in this whole world that we've created, and um, so we all have to be vigilant, and we all have to change the way we live, as Mary said. Uh, we have to all take responsibility for why these viruses are emerging and spreading so quickly. Um, so yeah, so that that's you know how we can get away from this mis misguided uh, policies that we're seeing. I really appreciate you reframing that. Definitely misguided uh, action is what we want to avoid. Uh, overcorrection, maybe is like you know maybe that's a little too safe. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I don't know when you were saying like, oh, like, why do we call it the Spanish influenza and had nothing to do with Spain? I don't know why, but like, for some reason, my mind thought like, kind of sounds like a Spanish word, influenza or something. <laughs> Anyways, uh, oh, would that, John, would you like to jump in? 
I think the word is actually the root, I think comes from Italian or something like that, uh, yeah. I was reading. Oh, yeah. And the Spanish, the Spanish flu apparently um, is because it was the Spanish newspapers that talked about it, whereas other governments tended to keep it down and censorship. But the sort of note of how it was spreading was through the Spanish newspapers. And because they were talking about it, it got labeled the Spanish flu because of the Spanish media. And so it had nothing well, to do with it emerging in Spain. But didn't the King of Spain get it early, John? I thought the King of Spain yeah. contradicted it early. And uh, did, but, it, there, but there was that thread of the, the newspapers and things in Spain talked about it more openly than some of the other media. So that was one thesis put forward why it was was the Spanish flu. Can, can um, we go back to overcorrection for a second, John? Do you, are you going to talk to overcorrection? Because I, I don't want to lose it. But were you going to say something about um, that? Well, I was going to go in the opposite direction, just brief reflection on how some cities pivoted really quickly to some action that seemed to be positive in terms of, you know, closing off some streets, opening up, you know, pedestrian spaces or, you know, the district and city of North Vancouver uh, somehow managed to write a bylaw for, yes, go take your bottle of wine and your picnic to a park and enjoy yourself. Vancouver, on the other hand, sort of, ooh, drinking in the park, ooh. We're not sure if that's even possible. Right. Um, and so the responses, I think, from different municipalities was really interesting to look at. Some that you wouldn't have expected to be creative were exceptionally creative. And others that had in the past been leaders to a certain degree of creative urbanism, like Vancouver, were just absolutely caught deer in the headlights, don't know what to do, and did almost nothing. And then late in the game, out on my little street, which is kind of a semi dead end street, they dropped a water filled road barrier that said slow street, which was then immediately hit by a truck two days later um, and then pushed out of the out of the way. And you wouldn't walk in the middle of my street, even though it's quiet, because people do use it and nobody slows down. And I think the responses instead of over correction, it was almost under correction in in the ability to be responsive to the immediate need which was we're not driving we're not taking the bus but we're out staying home in our community but the ability to kind of enjoy yourself in that way wasn't there and so i find that i think the under correction almost uh, is interesting mm. but sure. the flip side is uh Berlin and London, a couple of the other European cities did amazing work at dropping bicycle lanes in and dropping off traffic control and things like that. And then one of the courts in Berlin just ordered almost most of the temporary bike routes that they were hoping to make permanent removed and not removed at some point, but like remove it now. And in London, the same thing, they've got this amazing temporary bike network. And now councils are fighting with road user groups on whether to try to keep them or whether they get lifted out. And government, certainly under Boris, isn't exactly bicycle friendly and alternative transport friendly. And so there's a real fight on some of these rather innovative things that we all looked at and said, wow. And now they're being backpedaled at a very rapid pace. And so I think that kind of comes into your overcorrection a little bit in that. It's interesting to see how fast some things happen, how slow other things happen. Totally. Mary, I know I, you want to have the last word on this. Uh, before I pass it off to you, I'm going to uh, remind our audience actually that we do have the Q&A function. I'm seeing one question in there so far, so I thought I'd just give people a, a, a last chance to uh, ask your questions uh, through that uh, function uh, while we're having this discussion. Anyways, off to you, Mary. Yeah, what do you? Yeah. Well, it's not that I want the the last word. I, I'm just okay. wrestling myself with with how do we balance risk. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in both Kelly and John's views on this. How do we? What's an allowable risk? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what I'm. That's what I'm having trouble navigating in my own mind. This tonight, before I before I joined you, I went for a walk down my main street, which I do every night, Queen Street. So I'm on an arterial commercial street that runs from east to west in Toronto 
It has Queen Street East and Queen Street West, and it's a very vibrant residential street, and I live right on it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I am really struck every night by what I see as the changes. Mm. It's rainy here today. It's kind of cold. And we've had these wonderful patios, uh, even though they have these horrible, ugly bollards that they, they, the city puts down to pull the traffic off. They're ugly. But then, you know, restaurants put, pat put chairs out and heaters and plants and banners and stuff. It's really been fantastic. And, and I just think, boy, I, I would love this if this could stick. You know, mm. traffic is slow uh, because you, know, you haven't got the track. You can't pass the streetcars on the track. So it's going to be a pain in the ass for people, but it's really lovely. But today it's crummy and rainy. Mm. And on Wednesday evening, I'm seeing empty, 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 empty. And I'm, I'm interested in what Kelly would say as the public health person, because mm. I, I want to know, can we... You know, the Premier of Ontario has cancelled Halloween. Mm. That has led to unbelievable reaction from folks. And I, I want to get a sense of how do we navigate this and what John's perspective would be about how they did in, in, uh, in 1918. Because you don't want to, I guess you don't want to overcorrect, but at the same time, we live with risk all the time. And we take risks all the time for ourselves. Is there a way for us to somehow get to a place of personal responsibility where we're protecting ourselves and we're protecting someone else, but we're also still allowing people to earn livings and have some kind of livelihood. And I'm curious what tolerance of risk we need to have over the mm -hmm. next eight months, let's say. Sure. I, I totally hear you. How do we balance that risk? And I mean, like, I will say like, the thing that I that really struck me was like, you know, uh, particularly from John's presentation is like sometimes how we react, uh, in and you know like how how it seems like a big reaction to the 1918 pandemic was like to co-opt it to, you know, really oppress uh, some communities and and, uh, and I think like to me that would be a very misguided you know answer solution coming out of this current pandemic that we're in is to use that to further you know, uh, exacerbate inequalities and equities in our society. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone want to chip in on this? Or, or maybe I can ask another question. I was wondering if, is Wade still on this call? Uh, I, I had a question I was going to ask you if uh, he's, his camera is on. Well, so. can I, and can I see what oh, sure. Kelly thinks about risk? Because it's, this is yeah. her world. Mm -hmm. So I think okay. Kelly can weigh in on risk. Uh, uh, thank you, Mary. Um, there, No one's got this right. I mean, I think... It, Everybody's going to get, um, you know, graded at the end of this pandemic, and no country has got this right. Uh, possibly New Zealand, but otherwise, you know, we're every day decision makers are weighing risk. Individuals, we are risk assessing our lives every time we go out. We, should I take that bus? Should I, you know, go to that restaurant? Should I have those people over? We're all doing that. Um, and we have to remind ourselves, this is a novel pathogen. It's a new virus. So we don't know everything about it. We're learning as we go. So the advice changes over time. It's not because people are lying to us. It's not because they're, um, you know, um, getting it wrong. It's because they're learning new things and they're adjusting their advice to us. We have to listen to that. We also have to re realize that this is an inordinately uh, difficult time for decision makers. So our uh, public health officers, uh, Teresa Tam, uh, Howard New, and Bonnie Henry and all those people are working, you know, 24 seven to give us the best information they can. So I would, and maybe you might say, oh, well, she's a public health scientist, so she'll say that. But I would believe um, if, if as much as possible, follow the guidance that you're getting because they're they are the ones that are, um, um, you know, crunching all this information. Yes, you know, we're, we're not getting this completely right, um, but it's a balancing of, risks and benefits so yes people are I, and i recognize there's a lot of suffering out there economic suffering social uh, problems that are being caused by this um, re response to the pandemic not just the pandemic but the response to the pandemic and i'm looking at travel restrictions on you know the, the restriction on borders that's having a huge impact on people who work in tourism people who have to work um, you know in trade and so on and so i guess as a decision maker who's sitting there deciding whether to keep the US Canada border closed is what are the real risks you know uh, we're living next door to the epicenter of the global pandemic the United States 
um, they're making the decision that the risk is too high to open the border and allow people to flow through. Now, if um, the 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 balancing is, you know, what is the economic cost? What is the social cost of that? And so far, the public health risk is is higher than the others. But there's going to come a point where they're they're going to say, well, I think we could open the border a little bit more, or we could ease the restrictions a bit more. And it's kind of like a tap, you know, you're opening it and closing it and seeing what happens with the numbers. So there's this constant modeling of data and crunching of numbers. Um, so as an individual, I don't question because I'm not doing that modeling and I'm not doing that. I don't have access to that data, but so far, you know, Bonnie Henry and her group are doing an incredible job, world leading in some ways. And, you know, we're lucky, we're very lucky. So I would listen to them you know, reduce your social contact and don't second guess because we're not, you know, even I don't, I'm not an expert on this mathematical modeling of this virus. So I'm going to listen to those experts. And I know that, you know, that they're never going to be perfect, but I think that's how I deal with the risk. And, um, you know, it's when you see people go off and do their own thing and do their own calculations, say, well, you know, it won't affect me. I think this is where you see problems happening. So, so I know that's mm -hmm. a very conventional and, you know, uh, obedient <laughs> answer, Mary, but th this is how I'm living my life. And I think, um, uh, you know, listening to people who have better access to data than we do would, would probably be the, be the best way, I think, um, to manage risk. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, I do want to make sure we get to some audience questions. And for that, I'd like to pass it off to Jessica. Uh, Jessica Jiang, who's on this call, I believe. Do uh, you have an audience question that we can answer? Sure, we've actually got eight questions in. Um, Wade's yeah. question directed at Mary, so maybe we'll start off with that. Sure. Um, Kenneth asked for Mary, I agree that we should be wary of deciding too soon how we should recover. But is there not? Uh, but is there no scope for basic tenets such as resilience and collective responsibility for individual well-being? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I think what I what I was suggesting was to not predict. Uh, for instance, there are people predicting that cities are dead, mm. that everybody's mm. leaving, that there's a mass exodus. I've been on a couple of. Uh, media interviews where they say, well, you know, a lot of people, are, everybody's leaving the city. So that kind of thing is what I was reacting to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we should, should we dismantle transit? You know, those kinds of things. Big, grand uh, statements that we, uh, decisions that we don't actually have the capacity to make at, at the moment. I mean, I think there are common sense things like what Kelly just said. We should be reinvesting, re-upping in things like public health, libraries. They're kind of no-brainers we can see. We need to invest in and resilience to the point that the questioner is raising. We, we should, my, my experience over uh, being in disaster zones in the last number of, a couple of decades is that resilience centers, whatever form they take, coffee shop, library, park, whatever, wherever the con community is gathering to get information and to be able to problem solve together, we need to resource those places. Uh, and we need to have sustainable resource, resources for those folks so that they are equipped for whatever's next. Um, and we shouldn't have to. We shouldn't have to be debating those budgets every year and watch people try to cut cut back on those budgets. So, um, so I think there are. Yes, I think there are lots of positive things that we could be doing. I'm just suggesting that we not predict and make big sweeping decisions about this should stand, this should end, or this should stay. You know, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mary. Uh, I did have one question. If Wade is indeed in the the, the chat, uh, I'm I here. I'm Wade. here. Yeah. No, no, thanks. So I just wanted to make sure I, I you know gave you a chance to to to, to participate in this discussion. As well. uh, and I had a specific question for you, if that's all right. Uh, you know, in your chat, uh, you I, I think you briefly touched on uh, uh, a lot of how uh, indigenous uh, you know reserves were uh, responding to the pandemic and been actually very successful. Uh, at uh, keeping the co coronavirus sort of at bay. Uh, I, I was very curious to, to hear more. Uh, uh, like, was uh, were Indigenous people more quick to respond to the virus, do you think, be given the history that the community has had uh, with, uh, you know, disease outbreaks in the past? Well, we, uh, in Musqueam, we have, uh, we, we, like I said, we have, uh, knock on wood, we haven't had any, anything in our, our community yet. However, as the the pandemics, uh, the, the the months and the days went by, 
of course, like any community, there were deaths in our community and uh, we had, we'd have to have funerals, those types of things. And, uh, you know, for, for First Nations, uh, we all have relatives uh, in different communities. So we'd have people coming, coming to and from different communities. So you started to see the increase in, um, in incidents in different uh, First Nations. Uh, you saw it in uh, in and around uh, um, the lower mainland of, of, of Vancouver, and so we are, we've been trying our best. But uh, because the, uh, the the pandemic has has uh, has gone on longer than we thought it would be, we're mm-hmm. starting to see a a, a bigger in, uh, uptick in our, in in our different communities, and we, we're going to start seeing that more because we, you know uh, I, I answered the question earlier about our. our our um our communities we're 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 a large community we're not just musqueam we're squamish we're slewitooth we're we're the coast Salish people that a lot of our culture and our history depends on the longhouse culture in and around um you know the, the pacific northwest and our longhouse are supposed to start opening up in october or november and these are um, places for our ceremonies that we've been practicing for since time immemorial, and we'd have hundreds, if not a thousand, people coming from different areas, uh, whether it be Vancouver Island, whether it be up in the Fraser Valley, or, or down in, in, um, in in Washington State, because we all know that, that there were no borders uh, before colonization, so we still practice those types of things, and these are things that um, you know still we still resonate with, and we still want to um, share with our, our children. My two young children um, are, are starting to become more and more involved in those types of things, but we're having to cancel these types of, um, these, these gatherings as well. And, um, you know, uh, where, where we see these um, upticks are in our neighboring communities. And that's, that's uh, unfortunately uh, having, a, having us to cancel where our, our, our culture and our history is practiced in our longhouse. Yeah, yeah I'm really uh, sorry to hear. It. Yeah, that that you know uh, the struggle is so real on that, and uh, you know, uh, there, and I think a lot of us here can relate to that struggle. Uh, you know, uh, gathering together is, you know, uh, not just unique to Indigenous communities. It's unique, like it's we all, you know, I'm sure we all crave it right now. Uh, being on the Zoom call right now, I wish I was just talking with you guys in person. It'd make my life a lot easier too. Uh, I, I may, I'd like to maybe ask this one last question before we, we kind of pass it off to closing remarks. And it's actually based on something you, you said, Mary, uh, which I, you know, really struck me. Uh, it really that, um, you know, one mistake we kind of make is that maybe we overlearn from history. Uh, and so I was kind of curious about uh, maybe, you know, this sort of like anti the spirit of this particular event, but like in what ways is this pandemic different from uh, 1918? You know, what, what, what is sort of the unique challenge of this moment that we have that, um, you know, maybe we don't really have much of a historical precedent to? And again, I leave it open to uh, all of our panelists. Hmm. Intriguing question. Um, I think this one is different in one sense in that the communication is much more instantaneous. And so you don't have that delay in results and things where you pick up the newspaper and, and albeit newspapers are published three, four times a day and, and updated quite regularly. Um, I think it's the sheer volume of information and the lack of many filters that I think traditional media back certainly in the 1918, 1919, etc., would not filter out, but keep it to a dull roar. And I think, you know, this this one I could turn on the iPad and go to the news sites, and then it just streams by with all manner of things. And you know, back in uh, sort of 1918, 1919, what was more interesting was many times to read the newspaper ads versus the articles, because there you had all the crackpot cures. And so you had a dentist that was going on about um, bad breath was the cause of the flu. So you had to come to him and have some treatments done. Uh, Or you'd drink Mrs. Smith's elixir of something or rather. And similar to sort of sponsor 
content that you see in the Globe and Mail sometimes, but it, you know, graphically it looks different. So you know that it's generally sponsor content. Uh, back then, you'd be reading a stream of articles or short little snippets of news, and then they would just put an advert in and you would just start reading it. And it's, oh, no, this is an ad from a quackpot doctor, or this is an ad from whatever. And that way, information got out there, but I don't think it was as prevalent it's just in terms of the sheer volume of it. And I think that's one of the big differences. And so you have the phone in radio shows where everyone's an expert and you have every expert on who's an expert. And so I think that's one of the biggest differences is filtering the sheer volume of information about the pandemic itself it is, I think, the big difference here. Totally. Perhaps some cause for optimism, actually, uh, that we have so much more instantaneous sort of access to uh, information. Uh, mm -hmm. Would anyone else like to comment on this question? I would just jump in that, I, um, and uh, you know, again, on a positive note, it's, there's been an unprecedented level of cooperation among um, immunologists, um, vaccine development, countries cooperating, and um, in, in such a quick manner. Despite what we're hearing in the news about divisive, you know, um, divisiveness, there most of the countries in the world are actually cooperating, including Canada. And I think this is incredible. I mean, the the um, solidarity trials behind the vaccines and the treatments that WHO is coordinating is is incredible. To, if, if if you you know if you down <laughs> during the day, if you go on the website and you see the number of vaccines that are being um, explored and developed, the treatments as well, antivirals, you know, we got to hit something soon, hopefully, you know. Um, but that's that's an incredible effort by scientists around the world, and I think that gives me heart when when I feel down. Somebody get that website link right now in the chat. I'm <laughs> sure many people yeah. are wanting to. <laughs> and I feel the Sorry, same way. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I feel the same way about the way communities are responding. I think that, mm -hmm. I mean, there's fatigue, and there's extraordinary uncertainty. But I feel the same thing that, you know, resilience starts at the at the ground. It's a seed that grows, and um, I, I don't know if, if I've ever. I, I wonder what my colleagues would say. I find. This is an extraordinary moment in Canada anyway, where you've got a really humble federal government. It doesn't really know what to do. You know, I, I am regularly convening conversations on their behalf with stakeholders on what should we do about main streets? What should we do about small businesses? What kind of support do restaurants need? What does the hospitality sector need? What do vulnerable workers need? How are we gonna navigate transit? It's like everything is up for grabs and they're constantly solicitous about, well, what are the solutions? So I think this is a really interesting moment that, that in, in humility, in us collectively realizing we really don't know, we, we have to collectively figure this out. So that's why I suggested City Share because I think it's an example of people getting resourceful on the ground and finding ways to do it because we don't really have big master, you know, uber solutions that are going to work that people can, we don't have time to test things so even the proliferation of vaccine testing is happening in local labs at a, at a really um little a gazillion little exam you know what i mean like it's a lot of it's not a highly it's not nasa that's going to figure out the vaccine yeah. so i think that part is pretty interesting hmm. that it, knowledge has disaggregated and solutions are self-organizing hmm. and that that's a different moment in history, I think, mm -hmm. I guess. I'm, I look for John and Kelly to correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. there, but that's my guess, that we have a different, because of the level of connectivity, because we're just a lot more of us, mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that this has afflicted everybody. If you look at the other, mm -hmm. if you look at AIDS, for instance, um, AIDS was seen as a, as a disease that was affecting a very particular pers uh, population. Uh, whereas this is just affecting everybody. So it's mobilizing so many agents of thinking and change and innovation. And I and the, the perverse piece of this is there will be extraordinary, other, there will be other spin-off discoveries and other spin-off innovation that will be, that will spawn out of the pursuit of coping with COVID, whether it's the vaccine or other kinds of ways that we've been improvising. 
So if you think of the way when we had the Cold War, when you even when you think of the pursuit to get a man on the moon, that mm. spawned all sorts of activity and the same thing will happen again. So I think we're going to go through a period of extraordinary innovation after this. So it, if we can just hang on. What do you think, John? Am I, am I crazy? Yeah. No, no, I think uh, you're, you're highlighting something that I was thinking about um, a while back. Um, and I think the comment about how some folks really like the Zoom you know, phenomena because they get more work done. And, and I will attest to the fact that self-employed and, you know, I would have down tools and, you know, I'm 15 minutes gentle stroll away from Chinatown, but I down to the Chinese garden for a meeting or over to somewhere else in Chinatown for a meeting. But what that did was take meeting time out, walking time out, socializing time out. And, you know, I would lose a couple of hours before I got back to my desk. I, as much as I miss the in-person meeting, I really like the fact that I'm working away. I can put the report away, hit Zoom, have the meeting, say goodbye to the meeting, get report back up, and get back to work. Yeah. Now, I like that aspect of things. But what that brings up, though, is something that's really interesting for me is as much as Zoom and other formats have become a little bit, oh, my God, and they're fatigued about it, what it has opened up is a layer of connection we've never thought about before. Um, so over the Vancouver Heritage Foundation, for instance, I've been doing, I will not um, attest to their quality, but I've been doing some virtual walking tours for them. And the delight is to see that we've got folks from London, we've got folks from Prince George, Toronto. I think somebody checked in from somewhere else in Europe who are sitting there, whatever their time zone is, watching my presentation of a walking tour around a neighborhood. And for organizations that I'm involved in, like the Chinese Canadian Historical Society, we finally figure out how to broaden out board inclusion because of course now Zoom goes, well, we can have a board member from Prince George. We can have a board member from Fernie. Exactly. We don't need to fly them into Vancouver. They don't have to take the ferry over here for boring board meetings. They can sit at home and contribute. So I think it's that layer of connection that's been opened up, which we never would have explored unless we had to do it. And I think that's going to be one of the benefits. And I think that's only going to grow in just not the Zoom experience, but I think that's just going to change the way we work and operate. And I think hold conferences, you know, in, in terms of something like this, you know, would we have put Mary on a plane to get her out to Vancouver to talk about this, you know, at say, say Simon Fraser or this format and I think this format actually works in terms of the communication so I think that's going to be a potentially a fundamental change that might impact a number of different things and, and that's a positive thing that's come out of this I think yeah totally John uh, I, I think uh, this is this event is starting to feel like it's coming to a little bit more of an optimistic close uh, and as we bring this event to a close uh, well maybe before I do that uh, Wade would you like to uh, chip in at all for uh, to this uh, uh, conversation uh, you had any thoughts sorry I didn't realize I hadn't gone to you yet no it's fine I'm sorry I, I can't be on video right now I've got two kids running around in, <laughs> in the house here you, you have to realize it's 8 18 on a school night so I uh, I'm doing my best here. But, uh, you know, uh, I'm optimistic. We're, Musqueam's still here. Squamish is still here. Slewit is still here. There was a lot of people that, uh, that, 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 that tried their best to, to make sure we weren't here. So, um, w you know, we come, we come together and, and uh, you know, we, 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 will, we will find a way. Uh, Musqueam's doing their best. Uh, a lot of First Nations are doing their best across the province. And, uh, we, 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 you know, we're, we're more than happy to... To, uh, to to um, to share our our our, um, our experiences and and work with the greater community for sure. Right on. Thanks so much, Wade. Uh, so yeah, we are getting pretty close to the closing time of our event. So uh, you know, uh, to close it off, I would like to you know invite all our panelists to uh, maybe uh, if you have any sort of reflections on what you heard tonight, if you have any takeaways or any. Uh, sort of calls to action to our audience. Uh, I'd really like to invite you to 
you know, you know, uh, offer up a minute to sort of sum that up. Uh, while I have you maybe stewing on that, like I'll, I'll kind of ad lib here. I, I really enjoyed this chat and, and I really appreciate your guys' time, uh, especially yours, Mary, because I know like how late it must be in Toronto now. It's like what, 11, 11 p.m.? Like, uh, you know, uh, and just, you know, for me, like I, I'll admit, like I'm uh, being more on the journalist side of things, I tend to uh, really look for the issues and the problems and sort of see the you know uh, what what could go wrong in the future and, I, and i'm sure like there you know in our talk today uh, there were sort of uh, warnings maybe a little bit about that I, I think particularly from john's talk i really feel like uh there were mistakes made in, in the 1918 pandemic mistakes that maybe we're regretting today uh but i really appreciate that as we sort of kind of got into more of the discussion i think uh it was really cool to see how we all saw a bit of a silver lining in this. I think, uh, like, as you mentioned, Mary, uh, there is sort of a, a, a decentralization maybe of uh, knowledge that creation that is happening right now. But in this moment, we're, the key difference is that we're all connected still. We're all connected through technology, through, uh, yes, through Zoom calls and events, uh, but, you know, email, texting, all of that stuff, uh, social media. And, and you know, as much as we love to hate on it, I think there's also a lot of, uh, perhaps hope to to be seen that you know that uh, that uh, this is going to be a time for sure of incredible innovation and solution making uh, and, and you know hopefully through the uh, use of technology uh, we will be able to emerge out of this pandemic more uh, resilient than ever sorry that's my attempt at like a pretty you know inspirational <laughs> ending somebody play like you know like, you know violin music in the background uh but you know yeah again i'd love to pass it off to you guys to close uh, the real experts in the room uh you know what are your sort of takeaways of the night um and you know uh, and are there any sort of final closing thoughts you have well i'm i'm hoping that it offers a reflection on sort of again from just the city and the planning perspective in that it's it's not an immediate sort of, oh, let's run out and do a bunch of stuff. But I do think it's pointed out um, sort of some of the things that I think people really wanted as they had to stay home and use the city differently. And I think some of this pointed out sort of how, as Mary pointed out off the top, how badly designed some of our cities actually are in terms of their usability outside of driving to work going to the office, getting coffee, going home, um, when you have to use them differently, um, and maybe they force you into a user pattern that maybe we shouldn't be forcing folks into. And I'd really like to have just long, longer thoughtful thinking that you know we seem to engage in at the end of the sort of 60s and got into the 70s, certainly in Vancouver, and with a reevaluation of sort of the Robert Moses, let's tear it all down, build a freeway world, you know, there was some thoughtful reflection in terms of city building and housing components and things. And I think this offers an opportunity, I think, to reflect on how we've done things, because I think it has, you know, upended things to a certain degree and really pointed out just when you got a lot of folks out wanting to walk the streets and stuff, the streets aren't adequate. And the artist in Toronto that did his COVID frame and then tried to walk the sidewalks with a six foot frame around him and banged into every object everywhere on the sidewalk because the sidewalks you can't do six feet and so i think simple things like that and a re and a reflection on how we design the city i think would be you know a really lovely outcome of this just some thoughtful thinking about our cities in general well i'm like I said, I'm 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 not be I'm in the other room now, uh, so I can't put my video on because the kids are jumping all over the place. But um, what I was trying to say is uh, I wanted to to, to uh, respond to Kelly a little while ago that my, uh, Indigenous people in and the the Chinese community are are not that different because my grandfather in the 1920s immigrated to to Canada and met my grandmother who was Musqueam. And uh, I am one quarter Chinese because of because of that. And the reason why that was is because they were uh, both treated as third class citizens in this country, but they they persevered and they pushed through. And I think that you know there's a lot of things that we can we can learn from 
uh, our elders and our ancestors that went through uh, those times, that went through the, um, you know, the unfortunate um, uh, treatment that they that they that they were um, a part of. And, uh, you know, I, I look at that and I, I, that's why we're doing what we do in the Indigenous communities is because our elders uh, the, that have lived through these types of times before are telling us this because we lost uh, a, a great population uh, because of, of things of this nature. So um, I want to, to ensure that we uh, start listening to uh, our original uh, inhabitants and start uh, looking to, looking towards them because they've um, they've gone through a lot more than a lot of us uh, could ever imagine and and the Muscovian people are are, are 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 reaping the benefits of it because we're listening to our elders and our ancestors at the moment. Ellie, Mary, that's um, gone. maybe I'll just jump in if if that's okay, Mary. Um, Thanks, Wade. And I think actually my family, uh, my my late dad um, got to know your family um, through the Chinese uh, Military Museum connection. So I know your family, I know of your family and so have great respect for your family. Um, yeah, I mean, it, this has been a really interesting exercise, just kind of reflecting on my work, looking at global health, but also looking at my local, the local family history that I have and putting those two together and um, connecting them. I think what we learned from 100 years ago is that pandemics test the fault lines of any society. They really, you know, pathogens seek out the weak and it tests societies because it puts strain on social cohesion. So when you have a society that is inclusive and unified, it's, it's also more resilient. But when you have a society that, um, you know, is fragmented and divided and where people are marginalized or they're scapegoats, that society actually has a uh, uh, experiences a heavier toll from a pandemic such as this. So, so we have to learn from that. We have to learn from history. And I think Bonnie Henry's words are absolutely right in that sense, keeping us focused on what's important. Um, and going forward, I think for for me, um, from a public health perspective, it's about you know learning from this pandemic and the next one. I'm afraid there will be others. Uh, this is not the last pandemic pandemic we're going to have. So we have to think about Vancouver as a city at the crossroads of the world. We've always been connected with the world, but you know we're really um, even more so now in the 21st century. So if we think about city design, we have to think about not just how we live, but how we interact with the rest of the world. And it's our ports of entry, you know, by land, air, and sea. It's also about people coming here to make their homes here, but also we going out into the world and um, uh, in engaging with the rest of the world. So if we can create a city where, you know, we are uh, open, but we're also um, uh, kind and um, able to take care of uh, our, our own, but also any others who, you know, happen to cross our paths. I think that is a, a true global city. And I think also a much safer city for, for the next time round. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Mary, you have the last word. You know, you know, um, we it's a moment to summon our better angels. Or uh, as Wade was talking about our ancestors, I, I, I always the, the one thing that I that I would say at one point, Kelly, you were talking about are there models that have done better? Everybody's tried to figure it out. Everybody's made mistakes and you hearken to New Zealand and I, which a lot of us have in New Zealand envy, you know, and I, but I think that the the predicament we find ourselves in Canada is that we are so dominated by American popular media and social media and culture. And so I think if there's a moment of departure, excuse my cat here, there's a moment of departure for us to just really dig down and recognize that we are different, that we have a unique history and tradition and it's complicated and it's full of conflict and, and, and difficulty and we have, we're not anywhere near perfect. But in Canada, we have a commitment, a fundamental commitment to, to see people around us and understand that we have a collective life together. And I, I'm hoping that through COVID, that's gonna be affirmed and that we will resist being contaminated, if I can just use such a gross term, but I'm afraid that's how I feel, contaminated by the strife that is to the south of us for the next 10 days, let's see, and 
try to hold our own here that we and that's why bonnie henry's become such a folk hero for all of canada because she is leading with a compassionate empathic informed heart and i hope that that's where we will where we can hold ourselves as canadians in all our diversities and in all our failures and all our vulnerabilities if we can try to collectively meet and find that neutral ground together in this extraordinary challenge that's hitting us different hitting communities very differently but hitting everyone in some way and that's where resilience is i think is that that hyper local me to, me to you you to me and if we can have more me to you and you to me moments that's a that's a, that's a that's an important thing Thanks so much, Mary. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists that joined us tonight, John, Kelly, Wade. It was a real pleasure to have you all here. Uh, uh, that brings us to uh, our close. We're at 8.30. Uh, I, uh, I believe I, I am the one sort of closing off the uh, night. So, you know, I want to thank the, uh, the Vancouver City Planning Commission for putting this together, uh, a, an event that was really on such a important and relevant topic right now. Uh, shout out to our closed captioning person who I believe has a WPM of 275, which is really cool. Uh, shout out to Mary's cat in the background that I've been like, you know, sneaking peeks at uh, every now and then. Uh, and um, yeah, and just thank you to our audience for joining us here tonight. Thank you. You Tay, actually, we have a uh, Karen Krangle here, a commissioner, who's just going to say a thank you on behalf of the Vancouver City Planning Commission before everyone leaves. So, Karen, if you could turn on your microphone and uh, video. Okay, I think my there we go. Okay, um, I think you can hear me, but it says my video's been disabled, so you'll have to just listen to me, I guess. <laughs> okay. Anyway, well, well, this was a really fascinating um, and uh, thought-provoking discussion um, that we had tonight. And on behalf of the City Planning Commission and the Chronology Committee, um, thanks to the panelists and the moderator, and, and most importantly, the audience for joining us tonight. Um, I'd also a special thanks to uh, the Planning Commission's Executive Director, Yuri Artebis, for doing more than the lion's share of the, the work to uh, organize this event. You did a great job, Yuri, and thanks very much. I hope you found the discussion stimulating and, and, and that you're leaving with some ideas to uh, consider in the next few weeks. I think that we'll, we'll be in here for, in, in this for the long haul and uh, there's lots to think about. Um, I really liked what John said about using the city differently. I think that really, that, 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 that really, for me, that was a, that was very thought provoking. Um, as a token of thanks uh, to the panel's participation tonight, um, the VCPC will be making donations um, in their names on a, on a charity that, that does work relating to COVID in the city. Um, a video and transcripts and recording of today's event will be posted on vancouverplanning.ca. That's all one word, vancouverplanning.ca, within the next week or so. And as well, a summary of the event, along with the links to the highlights, video and transcripts will be submitted to the mayor and council for their information. Um, if you, and if you'd like to consider the con, con sorry, con continue the conversation, please join us on social media. Links are on the screen and in, in the chat room. And uh, to keep up to date on future VCPC activities and events, please join our friends of the VCPC email list and links are also on the screen and in the chat room. Thanks everybody and good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Great fun.